So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Joni Parsons. I'm co-creator of Rebel 11. We created Rebel 11 to have informative, meaningful, and fun events and retreats for women. And we're so happy that you're here today. We have about 7,000 women across the globe that join us regularly, which has been really exciting during, the, during COVID to expand to an international audience. So thank you for being here. I'm so thrilled to be talking about gardens and flowers today, and maybe we'll get some vegetables in there too, but it really is my favorite topic. And I went out in the garden yesterday and did a little video of all the tulips and daffies that are coming up and all the hellebores. And it's just such a wonderful reminder of spring and new beginnings. So with that, I'd love to introduce our guests today. We have so much to talk about. So I'm gonna read a little bit here. Um, but Terry, Terry say hi, um, is a garden writer and author of Black Flora. Terry is the urban gardening chair to the National Butterfly Garden at the U.S. Botanic Garden, and she is also a founder of Garden Club for African American Women in Gardening. She also has a blog and podcast called Cottage in the Garden, which I encourage all of you to check out. Welcome, Terry. Cynthia is author of House and Flower. She is known for her character-filled spaces in carefree flower design. Cynthia sustainably grows small batch specialty blooms, and she's also an interior designer using a combination of scale, texture, and color. Can't wait to hear more from you, Cynthia. Got lots of questions. And Jennifer O'Neill is a master gardener and author of Small Farm Big Dreams. Jen is owner of Pepper Harrow Farm, a 20 acre farm located in central Iowa where she cultivates flowers on seven and a half acres. Welcome, Jen. And then Robin, um, who will be coming up here, is co-founder and creative director of Bloom Imprint, why we're here today. She and Deborah Prinzing have helped these authors launch these books that we'll be hearing about today. And um, as the creative director, you'll see her beautiful work um, in the images that you'll see from each of the books. Welcome each and every one of you. I'm so happy you're here today. Um, so what um, I'd like to do is, Jen, just um, talk to you first really quickly. And um, many of you may know that uh, Pepper Harrow was hit with a huge tornado um, just a month ago, right, Jen? Yeah, it was coming up on a month. I think it's been about three weeks. It feels like an eternity ago, yet like yesterday at the same time. I don't know how that's possible, but yeah, we're coming up on the month anniversary. Uh, it hit on March 5th and it destroyed our entire farm infrastructure. So it's been a little bit crazy over here as I'm sure some of you can imagine, but for the most part, my gardens and, and my flowers were untouched. It was just all of the barns and the trees and wow. my beautiful little flower cottage that I like to, to decorate up and take photos in front of. So we're really in, in the process of, of rebuilding at this point, just trying to get our barn rebuilt so that we can continue to hold classes and events out here on the farm. I just... We none of us can imagine the horror of that happening. Um, and I've been watching for the last three weeks what's been going on at the farm and you and your husband. There's been a lot of beauty that's come out of this in the last three and a half weeks. If you could just mention that as well. I start to get emotional when I think about <laughs> all the wonderful things that have happened. Um, a lot of uh, the, the gardening and flower farming community has rallied around us uh, with donating plants, donating financially, helping us out. Somebody sent me um, posts so that I could electric fence in my tulips so that the deer would stay out of them. I mean, oh my gosh, amazing. Anything that you could think of, it has happened. And uh, somebody actually came up from Kansas City the other day, one of my friends came up, another fellow flower farmer to help us uh, pack and ship dahlias. So just in wow. all the ways possible. And then of course, our local community, 
I think most of our cleanup was done the day after the tornado. And there were literally 100 and 150 people that came out to the farm and helped us get everything clean up. Uh, if you've watched Adam's video, you can see the, the change from the morning until the afternoon. It was almost completely cleaned up. So, Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so glad that you have a community that is supporting you, not just locally, but nationally as well, that are coming to your aid in this time. So we can't wait to see what you create now. Thank you. So with that, Robin, um, we want to come over to you. And you and Deborah Prinzing started Bloom Imprint just last year, right? Uh, you're, you're muted. Thank you. I was trying to be muted for... Uh, <laughs> you're back. Everybody. There we go. And... Um, and then I wanted to get this. Can you see the? Um, yes, it's great. just beautiful. Tell us a little bit about Bloom Imprint before we get to some of the authors today. I, I would love to. And yes, Deborah and I have known each other for over 15 years. And then um, we decided to start a publishing company. <laughs> during the <laughs> we pandemic. just started a publishing company. That's what women do. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, now, of course, this won't work, right? There we go. So a little bit about Bloom. We focus on the floral lifestyle and each of these women who you'll hear today will exemplify that. And we, we work with everybody to develop and publish projects that shine a light on that lifestyle. And then we also are focusing on a new relationship with flowers. Deborah is the founder of the Slow Flowers Society. And this is all about local and homegrown and it's seasonal and sustainable practices. So all of the people who also who we work with are also um, supporting that effort as well. So about our books, just be, you'll see this with the ladies, but we have two target markets. It's the farmer florist and it's the home gardener. So because we see a real intersection there. And as you will see, as these ladies talk about their fabulous books, that it's their image forward publications, that um, we are very fortunate to be very image rich. And um, Jen and Adam in their book took most of the, it took almost, took all the images except maybe for two. Uh, Cynthia has taken um, the images in her book plus worked with two other photographers. And with Terry, we were able to get wonderful portraits from all the people she interviewed um, to use in her book. And you'll see that as we go through. Um, we have right now six books in the marketplace and um, Small Farms Black Floor is out. Small Farms Big Dreams um, is coming out in a few weeks. It's at the printer. And we are now working House and Flower will be at the printer in a month. And I'm just so thrilled that everything is being printed in the U.S. You are sustainably minded. Everything that you are you do has that in mind. And um, I just love that. Absolutely. It's very important to us. And it's also, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a blessing because um, as we um, as we went into the pandemic, we were lucky to have our printer down in Seattle um, and not with our books stuck on a boat offshore. Right, which is great, great news. Okay, so let's talk, um, Cynthia, let's talk about your new book, House and Garden, or House and Flower, and tell us about your inspiration and a little bit more about you. I just realized I, I didn't plan it this way that I'm matching my cover today. So first of all, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love when that happens. There, I did not plan it, but there you go. Um, you know, this book is really about promise and potential and the ability um, and the voyage to see beauty in our homes and our gardens in, in new and unexpected ways. So my husband, Graham, and I have had seven houses together. Um, most of the homes have been old homes in need of repair. People who uh, people might have overlooked the homes, might have overlooked the magic that was within them. So I think the book is really a love letter to these homes, as well as to encourage all of us to see the potential for making beauty in our spaces. And the inspiration 
I think that was one of the questions. I think that comes from anywhere. Um, inspiration is all around us. Uh, you know, in the books that we read, the magazines, the clothes that we wear, the walks that we take on the beach, it really informs the work that, that we do when we put into this book. And it's also, inspiration is also situational, I think, and it's evolving. Um, you know, the one of the homes that we had, um, was intended to be a flower farm. We were going to be flower farmers at one time. Uh -huh. and at that time, we were very influenced by the slow flower movement and the things that Deborah and Robin are championing. And, you know, we, we grew flowers in rows. Then we went on to another dream and we bought an old heritage home and we grew a garden that was very much of an English style garden um, and a lot of heritage varieties. And now we're back in the city. So our inspiration- <laughs> I love that. Once again- <laughs> And, um, you know, there's a portion, of, there's a part in the book where I, I talk about inspiration, and I think there's so much inspiration around us, and especially on social media, we see so much of it. We have to be careful. Inspiration without, um, in isolation, I think, is, um, it can be dangerous to your soul. So the whole point of the book is to inspire you to take what you like, find the inspiration here, and apply it in your own home. I mean, we all want to have Gwyneth Paltrow's home, or maybe we don't, but, you know, that's very aspirational, and it's a beautiful home, but we don't all live like that. So these are real um, things that we hope that you can do in your own lives and take away. And we're going to be talking about interiors um, to more towards the end, but tell us about bringing nature in the house and how nature inspires interiors. We saw several photos here um, before these interior shots of, you know, the color of the, I don't know if those were peonies, um, they went by pretty quickly. So, um, but then, and how, so can you go to the next page there, uh, Robin, um, one more. Oh, yeah. uh, this one down on the left. Yeah, the peonies with the pink walls. Yeah, I yeah. love that. And maybe you can explain just a couple of these images here. Well, sure. I mean, having flowers in the home is the, the, the easiest way to, you know, make that connection with nature. I mean, we're all craving that, especially now, even more so. Um, you know, gardening is on the rise and that need for that symbiotic relationship with nature. Mm -hmm grounding us is so important. So bringing flowers from your garden inside is one very easy way to do it. But we don't all have the opportunity to, to grow flowers or we're on our journey to growing flowers. So right. there's so many different ways you can get flowers. You know, you can, of course, get them from your garden and grow things that work for you. Or you can go to the you know the flower market or your corner store and you can get yeah, right here. <laughs> and, you know, this time of year, our stores are filled with bulbs. So you can take the bulbs and you can put them in little clay pots and they look beautiful in your home. You know, don't overlook dried flowers. You know, we have flowers from last year that we've dried and we, we use in our home or plants that you over winter. We've got some geraniums that we're keeping that continue to give blooms for us. So there's all different kinds of ways to infuse your home with nature and lift it and instantly elevate it. And one of my favorite things is, um, you know, from a walk, we, we found an old um, wasp's nest and we hang it in, in our dining room. And it just adds a, you oh, know, I love that. Um, element of, of whimsy and, and nature inside. So all kinds of things uh, you can do. Oh, Cynthia, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's go to Terry, um, the author of Black For Flora. It is just so beautiful and timely, Terry. Um, it's actually past due, I believe, to recognize black flower growers, florists, and enthusiasts. Tell us the story of um, black flower growers and a bit about the book. We've had to, a chance to talk and there's so much depth and richness in, in your book. Yeah, and it definitely, um, it's definitely caused a stir happily. Um, you know, Black folk have been gardening and farming from day one since we reached the shore. And many people don't realize, you know, but if you really think about it, imagine coming from a, a different land, not mm -hmm. knowing, being familiar with what you grow there and you come here and it's like, now what do we do? We made it work. We made it work. And some of the stories that the people in the book shared were just amazing. All of them actually were amazing. And their start, um, realizing that flowers are healers. And flower farming is it's an act of social justice and healing as well. So and it's just tell, us, 
Terry, tell us a bit about your story with um, your own history with with gardening. Well, it's on so both beautiful. sides of my family, my, um, my on my mom's side, my great great grandpa, he was a sharecropper, and not only did he grow food and flowers for his family, but he also delivered them in town. And on my dad's side, my dad was always telling me stories about Big Mama and Grandpa and growing and not having a hose and watering from the back of a, of a, a horse-drawn cart. So the story is rich and it mm-hmm. really gives me a good foundation on why I do what I do. Well, your ancestors would be so proud of you, Terry, for being a part of this book and putting forward all of these amazing creators. Like, why don't you tell us about a few of these folks here? Maybe talk well, to us about Mimo, D, Ashley, or Aisha. Well, Mimo um, went, well, you'll read about it in the book, but really her mom remarried and gifted Mimo with an interest in, hmm, what are these plants? She identified Mm -hmm. them and that was how her journey started. That's a brief version. Dee remembered the flowers from her ancestral home and growing up in New York by the uh, Botanic Garden, she made, has made her life all about flowers, which was great. Um, Isha, she kind of happened, she landed, on the way to an interview and the flowers found her. So, and I, I mean, it's just amazing how flowers have helped guide our path, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And how about Ashley? Um, Ashley, I call her, she's a minister of flowers because the flowers came from within her and she creates using them. No guidance, no tutorial. She sees a, a, a leaf and she begins to envision the possibilities. Wow. It's so rich, this book. I mean, I can't tell you, you just go through each and every page in awe because of the images and the way Robin put those together and the storytelling that has been done, Terry. And I think what's so beautiful as well is that you have this, this, these rich stories that you, um, you can tell about each and every one of these folks. And they're so unique and they're just so unique. And their stories, um, if you wanna compare them, they're almost like they're seeds because some other black person, male or female, doesn't matter, is going to read this book and they're gonna be able to identify with one of the seeds from this story. Each portrait, if you will, is a story. And it's going to touch somebody and make them think, maybe I too could be a flower farmer, or maybe my designs are good enough to be presented to the world. Why not do it? Yeah, or just do it for yourself at home as well. Um, So thank you, Terry. Let's go to Jennifer and tell us about your book, Jennifer, um, Small Farm, Big Dreams. Yeah, uh, a little bit about Small Farm, Big Dreams is um, we really wrote this book with the desire to make flower farming just a little bit more pared down, make it scalable for the readers so that they could understand how to do what we do even if it's on a small scale in their backyard, we wanted to debunk and demystify a lot of the complicated things that you know, are, are floated out there. And not to say those things are wrong, but we want to extend kind of some practical advice that make people feel confident with trying some different things or experimenting. And even, I know I'm gonna say this and everybody's gonna like gasp, but to fail at some things, it's actually okay to fail. And I say <laughs> it, it with a, I say it with a smile on my face, but it's actually good to fail. It doesn't mean that you know it's going to be done forever. It means that you tried it, you didn't succeed. Maybe you come back to it later. Maybe you don't. Maybe you modify the process that you're doing. Whatever. But I want everybody to try and experiment and try different things. Push the envelope. Try things that. Uh, with growing that have never been done before, experiment and see what works for you. So throughout the book, uh, we kind of just 
pare down and, and give our practical advice and share our journey. The tone throughout this book is very encouraging. So if you're especially just starting out on your journey in flower farming, this is the book for you because it's gonna help make you feel like it's very relatable. We share uh, the things that we failed at, the things that we do really well. And I think it's gonna speak to a lot of people because you know there's no perfection here at all. We still make mistakes and we're flower farming in year 11 on our property. That's and we terrific. Still, we still make mistakes. I mean, that's just how it is. What inspired your love of gardening? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, I was inspired my, by my grandmother. My mom, we have a very tight knit family. My mom would take me out to my grandmother's house so they could visit. We would run around her farm and she had massive flower gardens. And I would also uh, kind of hang around her when she was doing floral design, watch what she was doing. And to get me out of her hair, she would send me out to the garden with a pair of scissors or floral snips, whatever she could find. And she'd say, go cut a bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, in retrospect, now I know that she was just really trying to get rid of me, but that really helped me create a personal relationship with flowers. I would visit with her when she was out weeding. She would identify flowers for me as she was doing her gardening. And even my own mom, that got carried to her and she taught us a lot, taught me along. And, you know, I, it took me a while to get back to gardening. Um, you know, I kind of viewed it as a negative thing when I was growing up. I think most mm -hmm. kids do. My own oh, kids. For sure. I did. Yeah, my own I was like, I'm not going to go out in the garden. Are you kidding? <laughs> I know. And, you know, I always felt like it was a punishment to have to go weed the garden. And I was always out there doing that. Or so I, so I feel like later in life, but what a blessing it was and all that info, that wealth of information I was able to take in. So my kids don't like it, but I'm hoping later in life, they're like, you know what, we had a really good upbringing and we know all about, you know, how to grow things from the ground, whether that be flowers, vegetables, fruit trees, or whatever, like I'm passing it along, even if they're like resenting me along the way, I know they'll come back to it and have gratitude for it later in life. Yeah, they'll understand how beautiful it is to understand where a vegetable comes from and and not just go to the grocery store to buy one. So thank you for teaching your kids that and so many others. Well, one of the things we wanted to talk about today are, are tips that for all of our authors to share. So let's, um, why don't you start, Jen, since we're here right now, um, what are some tips that you have for our audience today? From a gardening standpoint, uh, a few tips that I have is try the easy flowers to grow. There's you know, Cosmos, Celosia, or Celosia, however you say it, uh, Zinnias, try some easy flowers to grow first. You know, once you master those, kind of branch out and do some other things. And same way with houseplants, you know, try to pot those. It's very easy to grow. You're going to get your feet wet, and then you can continue to try and experiment with a few more complicated things. So I'd say that's my biggest tip. I mean, uh, yes. I mean, I just tried to grow um uh what is it the fig plant inside it was like a complete disaster and going back to you, what you said earlier about just trying things see if they work and if they don't just try again um you know i do that in the in my garden i do that with all the house plants and i think that's such a good reminder that you can't make any mistakes you're just it's just a learning process all of the time yeah i agree Okay, so let's go to um, Cynthia. Talk to us about some of your hot tips, Cynthia. Right, well, this, currently we're in an urban environment. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, some of you, people with smaller gardens can try. And one of the things that we experience here in the neighborhood, neighborhood gardening, mm -hmm. is that our backyard is surrounded by trees. So we have a lot of shade. So. I hear a lot of people asking, you know, well, you can't really have a garden in a shade, you know, shady garden. What, what's going to grow there? So one of the techniques that I have, which because I really want to grow flowers that I can bring inside, <laughs> to really focus on, on the shoulder season. So I plant a ton of bulbs, the ones that the squirrels don't get, that give me a lot of early blooms in the early season before all the foliage of all the trees fall um, come in. Mm -hmm. So I start with, um, with lots and lots of bulbs. And then think about um, the shape and size of your garden, go vertical. So we also have a lot of toperies or pillars made out of chicken wire. So we grow vines and 
clematis and different kinds of things that grow up high so you can maximize your space. So I would suggest that raised beds are also a great idea. If you have dogs or children, you don't want to get into the garden. Mm -hmm. It also creates a great perimeter and, you know, I, I call it eyeliner for the garden. So um, lots of things, as, as Jen was saying, start with things that are simple. Like uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of people are doing um, uh, starting their seeds inside but if you're just starting out find seeds that you can direct plant it makes it a little bit easier if you can take the cosmos and the sunflowers and put them right in the garden right away and you get that gratification mm -hmm. that you see little sprouts coming so that's so fun again, just try just try that's all you need to do <laughs> and can can you talk a little bit about um color during the winter months, you know, you, you talked about the shoulder seasons, but so many people don't believe that you can have color during the winter and you really can. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So our kitchen dining room looks directly over our garden. So it's a really important view that we have all season round and the winter is really important. And we thought about that very much when we designed the back garden. Um, so the, the things that you would do to keep that alive would be things like planting grasses, masses of grasses, um, and there are varieties that grow in the shade that you can leave um, the, the plumes on that give great habitats for wildlife as well as give you interest, shrubs and perennials as well. One of the things in a shady garden particularly or um, is trying to get perennial interest. So flowers that will continue to bloom and shrubs that will continue to bloom and give you that um, full season drama that you're looking for. And any other hot tips for spring, since we're right there right now <laughs> in April? <laughs> well, you know, we all get really itchy feet to get out there and I want to go and take all the leaves off the garden, but I think I have to have a little bit of patience because we've still, we still had snow the other day, it just comes and goes. So be patient, um, but just get out there and play. I mean, it's, it, that there's nothing like a garden in spring after a long winter to make you yes. feel <laughs> yes, I know. It's just so delightful. I can't even tell you how yeah. much it means to me to walk through the I, I'm checking on our tulips every single day I go out there. Okay, how much more? It's like, is it one day, two days until they're going to bloom? So <laughs> there's a lot of excitement right now. And I check on it regularly. Okay, Terry, let's go over to you. Um, what are your hot tips this year for the garden? Well, in my garden right now, and hearkening on that winter interest theme, I have hellebore, and they're yeah. in full bloom. And I do cut them and put them in vases because they are just absolutely beautiful. What people don't think about is, think about what's underground. Consider bulbs. Bulbs will make you look like a professional at your whatever your game is. Put a bulb in a pot and then put your annuals over it or sprinkle seeds on top allow your garden to evolve. Also consider containers. If you don't mm -hmm. want to get out in the garden and dig, or if you know you can't bend over as much, containers are your best friend. You can have a meadow in a container. Um, one lady in my garden club was saying, the tree canopy has increased. Once again, caladiums, impatience. Think about your lighting and then explore the opportunities. Uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing, I have a lot of experimentation going on in my property. I had to take a tree down. Well, instead of being in sorrow about it, I'm looking at it as an opportunity. So that's where that cutting garden's going. Oh, that's good. So what are you going to plant in that cutting garden? Oh my goodness. I've got a lot of seeds um, that I've been harboring, but definitely pollinator plants, echinacea that I started um, by doing a little bit of winter sowing. And then dividing up my perennials and moving mm -hmm. them over because I can use them in vases as well. I think you would be really good talking about the palette of the garden. Um, it's ever changing. And I think that that's one of the most fun um, aspects of gardening is that nothing is ever as it is the next year. I mean, we're constantly moving and evolving and adding to and taking out. Um, and that sounds like what you're doing right now. Yeah, and honestly, I had an oak tree trimmed, which really adjusted the lighting in my front garden. And it was right by my root back your herder. Well, if you've had a tree taken down, you know, the tree guys really aren't paying attention to your plants. And I thought, oh my goodness, that ground is compacted. Growing with native plants, 
durable plants. That space now is filled with the basil leaves of Rudbeckia herda. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I've got to get more mountain mint, more Menarda, because that's my area of interest for the mm -hmm. pollinators. I don't have to worry about that now. So that's terrific. Go with your garden, evolve with it. Okay, so let's go on to the next question, Terry, since you're here. Um, what are some of the top questions you get and the answers to those questions? Um, is it, can I plant seeds now? Or can I plant now? If you're, I'm in zone seven, it's too cold. I know, it's, it's so, you want to get out there right now and do it. The ground is too cold. Mm -hmm. The ground must warm up. So mid-May, that's a top one. Um, can I grow vegetables in containers? Can I have a meadow in container? You can grow anything in a container. <laughs> you just have to be willing to experiment and do your research. You know, that is key. Mm -hmm. Know your zone. People want to know what zone am I in? The Department of Agriculture will guide you on that fact. Those yeah, and you can just go questions. online and get that yeah, pretty those easily. Yeah, are the top three questions right now. Okay, so let's go to you, Cynthia. What are the, some of the top questions you get and the answers to those questions? Well, I think most of the questions that we get center around our front yard garden. So as I said, we have an urban uh, footprint and the front, our front garden is the only place that we really get a lot of sun. So that's where we do a lot of our experimentation. So it's about, it's a seven by seven square. And every seven year- Seven by seven? Yeah, it's not large. <laughs> this is the front, because <laughs> the car goes in the other part, right? So, um, and every year, this is where we've taken some of the techniques that we've, when we were being flower farmers. So we fill it with landscape fabric and we burn holes and we plant, and we plant seeds. And the, it's amazing because we're on a, you know, a, um, a traffic, not lots of foot traffic on our street. Yeah. And people are asking us all the time, what are you growing in there? And every year we change. We've done ornamental broom corn. We've done amaranthus. We've done sunflowers. And we we've even did, we even did barley one year. So the whole front yard is, is that. It looks like an agricultural field. And you know, it's part of the rebel in me, but it's also part of the educator in me where we're trying to share this with people. And it's amazing to see that, you know, they, what are you planting this year and how long is it going to take? And it's always amazing to see something from a seed grow to like seven feet tall in a season. So um, we use that as an opportunity to talk to people. Um, they ask us where we get our seeds from, you know, um, what colors are we using? When do we plant them? And what are we going to do with them? So all those kinds of things are just it's an opportunity to open up a dialogue and to encourage more people to just to grow anything. <laughs> just, sorry, anything. So anything. what are you seeing as far as top colors this year? You know, there's always trends. There's trends in, um, you know, clothing. Are you seeing any trends in flowers this year? Well, you know, I, I like to encourage people to do what they like to do and to kind of eschew yeah. the trend a little bit, honestly. But I, what I, I, so I say plant what you love. And what I love right now are doing masses of beautiful colors, whether they be some of the soft, like, so this is one way to sort of elevate your garden a little bit. Instead of maybe doing bright sunflowers um, that are the typical orange, um, maybe do a russet or a brown or a really soft buttercream. And that's where you can take things and play with it and not just necessarily, mm -hmm. like they're simple plants to grow, but look at it a little bit differently. Similarly with your zinnias, instead of maybe the riotous colors, which are beautiful, maybe try some of the softer palettes in the creams or the, the roses. The, the, and it just really makes you look at things differently. But just plant what you love. <laughs> okay, I just had a great idea. I think I'm going to ask my neighbor if I can take a strip of his property and just do a cutting garden. Thank you for that idea. <laughs> I'm going to go knock on his door later today. Um, how about you, Jen? Um, I would love to hear from you some um, top tips that, or from questions that you get. I mean, there's so many people that are watching, you know, what's happening with you and your husband and the farm. And um, outside of that, as far as the garden and veggies, what are some of your top tips? Yeah, I was going to carry on on the colored trend. I loved what Cynthia just said about the, the kind of muted colors 
the neutral colors, uh, I would say terracotta is a hot request in terms of wedding flowers this year. I don't know where it came from, but I'm like, there's not a lot of terracotta things. So I'm actively trying to look for those muted buttery tones. So that, that was a great, that was something great to say. Interesting. I really think that is a thing. Um, by the way, on the, on my top tips for this year, by the way, I think the three trends I'm seeing are on big stands of Cosmos and I saw Cynthia right before today on Instagram, you posted your big English style yeah. garden, uh, with all your Cosmos. So yeah. hot right now. Cosmos are going to be the big thing. We actually have something coming out in May where we're going to be doing, uh, talking a little bit more about Cosmos. Uh, ornamental grasses is, is the other one. And I heard you say that too, totally on trend. And then house plants are all the rage right now. Crazy. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening, but it's going crazy. The return um, of the seventies. <laughs> it's crazy. I love it though, because you know, like, I just feel like people who nerd out on, on all the plants and all the flowers, you're my people. <laughs> so even, even being on today's call, I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's just like hearing myself talk. And I'm like, I just feel so connected to you guys because we all, the things you're saying, it just resonates with me like hundred percent. But a couple questions that we get asked a lot being on a flower farm is how wide are your rows? So like, like Cynthia, we use the landscaping fabric and we do six inch rows. We, le we leave two feet on either side and we plant four feet down the middle, but we like to have little pathways on the sides of our, our standard beds so that we can get in and harvest out and make bouquets, cut our flowers and make bouquets. The other thing we get asked a lot is why don't you stake your dahlias? And uh, the short answer to oh, that, yeah, the short answer to that is because we don't think it's very attractive. <laughs> We have a lot of people who come out here and take pictures in our, on our giant dahlia fields. We think that the posts and the netting are unsightly too. So we plant our dahlia, our dahlia tubers very close together and it, they really support themselves oh, and good. stay up. If we get wind that comes through and just make a deep cut, if something falls to the ground, we make a deep cut and cut it on the side. They just regenerate and regrow themselves. And I mean, when you grow thousands and thousands of plants, it really, you know, if a couple fall over, no big deal. So we just start from scratch and let them grow back up again. So a quick question on that, because I'm about ready to plant some dahlias here in the Pacific Northwest. Do you plant them a little deeper then? No. Or I, sa same depth, but just closer together? Yep, same depth, but just a little bit closer together. We typically plant our dahlia tubers 12 inches, maybe closer. You didn't hear okay. that. Today. <laughs> <laughs> I might yeah, find we, today. <laughs> yeah, really, really close together. Uh, by the way, my aunt and uncle are going to, uh, I think it's, oh, Whatcom County is having their dahlia sale today. So they're, they're hitting that one up for me. Hopefully they, oh, they excellent. get some good ones for me. <laughs> huh, I'm going that direction later today. Hmm. <laughs> Danger. Um, do you, um, with that, we're going to ask the, um, our audience if they have questions, but are there any other tips or um, questions that you guys want to talk about before we um, change gears here? I just wanted to say, get back to basics. People, you know, there's so much stuff out there that you can buy. I so agree with Jen about steak and dahlias. You know, get back to basics. You don't need all the things. Plant those flowers, you know, the way you want them because it's your garden. And people will see it. I have no lawn. My entire front yard is nothing but flowers. And my neighbors, at first, when I first moved here, they kind of gave me a side eye. Um, but now everyone is kind of coming along and they're watching the show evolve. Just do it. Just do it. I would, I would attest to that as well. I've had my little um, craftsman house here in the Seattle area for many years and like 20 years. And the first thing I did was I took out all the grass on my whole entire lot and people by hand, I'm just going to say there's a lot of shoveling in that. Um, but I can't tell you, it's so fun. I, I sit here, this is my office, and I can watch everybody going by the garden and they stop and they look and it's just so beautiful, the amount of interaction that I have with my neighbors because we have, it sounds like you, Cynthia, we have a lot of traffic, um, foot traffic near our house. 
And it's such a beautiful way to connect and, and also to share. Like now I'll take um, bouquets to my neighbors and, you know, I'm kind of the flop, crazy flower lady. And I love that. I love that title <laughs> so much um, because, the, and, and the garden's always changing, Cynthia, like you said, it's like try different things. And um, so I want to take a break from flowers and talk, Cynthia, a little bit more about interiors. And because you're so well known for your interiors, do you want to give us some thoughts on what you're seeing for 2022? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I think if anything that the last few years have have taught us is that our homes are even, you know, more sacred and special to us than before. So I think that people are taking their homes and trying to maximize every inch of it, mainly because, you know, maybe because we've been in them so much, but I'm looking at the walls and thinking, what can I do? Yes. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, our, our spaces are becoming such multi-purpose spaces. You know, we're working from home. Um, you know, we're vacationing at home. Our kids are at home with us. We're schooling. We're working out at home. So, making spaces that are as flexible as possible. But I also think there's there's what's been cropping up is, and we talked about it a bit in the garden. Is it's the same thing. There's this profound sort of sense of independence I think that we're finding with our homes and, and the desire to personalize and to make it yes. our own and to make it special and to care for her. So that's where the garden comes in because we're taking the lessons that we've learned from home and now we're testing a bit more. We're in the garden now, okay? I've done all this great stuff in my home and now I'm gonna try this in my garden. So for me, the symbiotic relationship between the two is really important. Um, but I think the, the bigger th the thing to leave you with is, is that, you know, it's your home and you should have that home the way that you want it to be. And mm -hmm. uh, nobody has to love it but you. So make it your own and, um, you know, take the courage from all of these books and the inspiration to make your gardens and your spaces yours, because that's the only person or people who have to love it. So. That is such valid advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I've spent some time updating my health based on being here is 24 seven and working from here. Um, so a couple of questions from the um, from our viewers today. So um, one was and anybody can raise their hand on who wants to go ahead. Jennifer, do you want to talk about the bulbs? Yeah, so the question was, should I dig my dahlia tubers up and bring them inside for the winter? Yes, if you're in a cold climate. I know some of the people in the southern half of the United States, they're in the safety zone and they don't have to dig them. They can leave them up. But I think the cut the cutoff is probably zone six and above. We all have to dig up our dahlia tubers and store them for the winter. And there's various techniques on that. Uh, but we do have a Dahlia storage video that you can check out on YouTube. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we, we go through and we show um, how we do the process, how we store them. They're particular, it, you know, they're very easy to grow, but the storage is always like, everybody does it a little bit differently. And again, I encourage when you do it, you just have to find out what works for you. That's great. How many Dahlias do you dig up per year, Jen? Uh, we dug up 10,000 Dahlia tubers last year. <laughs> And our, wow. we usually store them in our walk-in cooler and we're almost out of room. So we have to figure that out. We're kind of at a, a threshold where do we, do we go bigger or do we stay where we are? But there are a lot of, there are a lot of value tubers to dig up. They're everywhere. That sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> um, so have you seen an increase on the focus of native plants and uh, plants that will assist pollinators? Who wants to take that? <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Terry. Terry, why don't we go from Terry to Jen? Okay, um, yeah, there has been an increase um, in attention to natives and I am a, a big believer in native plants. And honestly, I don't really water my garden. I have a lot of natives in my garden. And when I do, I water with jugs because I'm very water wise. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. but I'm in suburbia, but I do have an urban garden, it's small in the front at least, but um, natives mixed with <laughs> non-natives create a diverse palette in the garden. Diversity is always good. So there has been a lot of interest, but one thing you have to be careful of, a lot of your natives 
can be um, a little aggressive. So do your research, know what you're planting. Yeah. Jen? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say I, we have done pollinator plant packs where we basically set people up with a pollinator garden. We, we did that last year. I didn't do it this year, but there was a huge interest in that. Um, I, I sell little butterfly garden packs of seeds and those have been flying off the shelves because there's a lot of interest in that. And then uh, like you, Terry, here on the farm, we actually have a specific pollinator bed where we, we put a lot of those pollinator plants and it's, it has been amazing to see. We sell tons of caterpillars on there. There was a lot of milkweed in there. We're a way station for the monarch migration. So we see monarchs laying, laying their eggs, oh, wow. and hatching out caterpillars. We're just now trying to get to that step where we protect them a little bit so that the uh, birds and things don't eat them. <laughs> but yeah, lots and lots of local interest about pollinators. And Terry, you're right with the watering. They don't need as much water, which is really cool to see. Yep. Do you have some favorite uh, pollinator plants that you'd like to share? I love butterfly weed, giant, giant swamp milkweed uh, is another really pretty one. Uh, I grew rattlesnake master this year, which was <laughs> that's a new one for me. The texture on that, it's like a ringium yuccafolium. And uh, uh, oh gosh, there's so many like asters are a really popular one with the pollinators. They were all over them. I mean, I could nerd out on pollinator stuff because I really, that's where my desire is to like just plant a pollinator stand that I don't cut and give back to the, the natives or to the, to the, to the pollinators. Uh, uh, Cynthia, how about you? Oh, I think all the same that you've talked about. I mean, a lot, we have a few more um, challenges with the shade that we have in the back. So it's always a balance of trying to get something that will grow that will attract. But um, any of the, some of the annuals that I've had success with, like even um, dill has been a great um, uh, attractor. Do you as put well. that in a pot? Sorry, do you put that in a pot? You don't no, put, okay. Okay. Uh, no. uh, okay. And um, echinacea is always something very popular with them and butterfly bush, things like that. And then it means they all they all attract them. It's, it's amazing the ecosystem that you create um, just by putting some things in your, in your garden. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, we're, we're really looking at that in our garden and I'm encouraging my neighbors to do that as well. <laughs> so um, last minute, anything else that you would like for your audience to take away today? Why don't we go to you, Cynthia, first? Well, I think uh, we've talked, I think it's, been a, it's a constant theme, which is so wonderful from all of us um, today is that you know, you've got this, this is, you know, your home, your garden is yours. And it's something that you should feel confident taking some chances with, um, uh, get the tools, get informed, uh, you know, read some of these books and learn from, from yes, the, for sure. In here. Um, but don't be afraid. And I think it's so wonderful to hear us all saying the same things. Like it's not failure, take a chance demystify gardening. I think gardening is kind of, there's still a little bit of a fear factor with that with people. And when I talk to people there, you know, how did you make that grow? Or is this going to grow? And how, how is my garden going to look and, and thrive? And it's just, it's trying. And the most amazing thing is mother nature will take care of it. Um, I often say that mother nature is the original stylist and she really oh. Everything that we do in terms of texture and color patterns. And, and she really does does take care of us. So just trust her. <laughs> Cynthia, I love that so much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Terry? Um, to borrow from our garden club theme, let's play outside. Get <laughs> outside and just do it. That's yeah. number one. But number two, which, you know, my neighbors, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not, or happy or sad. Let it lay. Don't go out and clean up your garden to the bare ground in the fall. Leave yeah. something to protect all those wonderful beneficial insects that need a safe place. Um, I, I clean up my garden in phases, but a lot of it just lays. There's something about in the middle of February after a snowstorm, which randomly we had this year, to lift up a leaf and see something moving underground. Let it lay. Don't be in a rush. Allow nature to evolve as it should be every season. 
That's beautiful. And we had a late snowstorm here in the Seattle area uh, and quite a bit of snow for our area. And it was amazing how resilient all of the plants were. And, you know, it's like you look at that and it's just such a nice analogy for life that we are also resilient, Jen, as um, as you are with what happened um, in Iowa for you. But the plants, Mother Nature does take care of us and takes care of themselves. And it was beautiful to see the new growth after the big snow here. Um, Jen, what about you? Uh, well, like to carry on with that theme about, you know, don't strive for perfection in the garden. Um, we shared out on TikTok that we leave all of our annuals in place and our perennials too. We like leave the dead sticks up and all of that place. It provides food for the birds during the, the birds that don't migrate. It provides food for them. It provides habitat. It protects the soil from eroding away with a lot of those winter winds that blow through. So think about it. It's a natural way to do it. It's, it's giving back to nature and you're getting rid of your perfection. Not everything has to be clean and tidy all the time. It's okay to have some natural areas. And then the other thing is just be inspired by nature, take in what's all around you. And I heard that echoed with uh, the other panelists here, you know, look around you, be inspired and just take little bits of inspiration from nature and incorporate it into your own garden style. And I think the other thing to take away here as well is that as gardeners, we all like to share our knowledge with each other. And um, when people walk by, and I'm sure Cynthia and Terry, you know, for you having urban gardens as well, we share all the time. Or here's this, you know, here's a here's a little extra that I have. Or there's just so much in. Um, the gardening world that we want to share with one another and nature provides, right? So I am just so grateful to all of you for joining us today. And I'm so inspired by each of you. And I can't wait to get your, I, Terry, I have your book and I just absolutely love it. And Cynthia and Jen, I can't wait to get yours. And um, so thank you. And thank you for being advocates for gardening and nature in each of your respective areas and for all of us around the globe. So thank you. Thank you for having um, me. And Robin, thank you for being here and sharing your beautiful work with us as well for on each of the books um, from Bloom Imprint.